between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Einstein Bagels, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran, and it's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Jay Steinfeld. He's the founder of Blinds.com. He set up the original e-commerce site, No Brainer Blinds, for $3,000 in 1996, and his first domain in 1993, and has since grown the e-commerce company to over $200 million in annual revenue. It's the world's top retailer for blinds and shades, and provides blinds for over 1 million windows every year, and the company was acquired in 2014 by Home Depot, and one of the most impressive feats, Jay, in my mind, is you went one-on-one selling into people's homes for 14 years while helping raise three kids, sometimes working seven days per week. Uh, Thanks for joining me. Uh, It's great to be here. Thanks for asking me to be here. So Jay, you have some great stories from the first office and then transitioning from the store. So give like paint a picture of the first office for people. Well, the first office was my, was my house. I started in, in a store in 1987, so I've been in the window covering business for almost 30 years. Right. Uh, my wife and I had a store. It was called Laura's Draperies, and my wife's name was Naomi. Okay. And we, she started it. I had just been fired from my job, so I needed something to do. I always wanted to be in business and decided, hey, I'll, I'll run a, a, uh, a drapery shop as well. So we both had stores. She would go to people's homes. I would go to people's homes. We'd be working seven days a week, six days actually into people's homes. On the seventh day, we did all our paperwork, and we were raising kids at the same time. That's a crazy schedule. Well, it was crazy. I was making money. I was not developing any wealth. And as a result, if I didn't work, I made nothing. Right. As a lot of sole proprietors would do. Yeah. It was a 1,001 square feet, the showroom. Well, in 1993, I had heard about the information superhighway and decided, well, Laura's Draperies could have a website. Yeah. Uh, this is the year before Amazon, so I didn't know you could sell anything online. Nobody was selling anything online, right. to my knowledge. Right. So we opened up the website in 1993, Laura's.com, and then Amazon's selling books. I said, well, if you can sell books, maybe you can sell blinds. So I gave it a shot. It was really no big deal. So for the, the Laura site, cost 1500 I said, I want to make buying blinds and shades a no-brainer, and we called it No-Brainer Blinds. <laughs> right. I was selling it basically out of the house, and we wanted that first office, as you mentioned. Uh, it was at 4815 Pine Street, which sounds like a house, which was a house. So I changed the address to One-Brainer Tower. It was No-Brainer Blinds, One-Brainer Tower, Bel Air, Texas. So that it sounded big. Very fancy. Plus. Bel Air, Texas, yeah. Yeah, very. Bel Air. It's not the Bel Air you're thinking about. <laughs> Suburb of Houston. And that, that's how it all started. So I was doing it. I still had the Laura's Draperies store, my day job. And at night was just occasionally taking a, a sale. People would call into the, to the showroom of Laura's and they'd say all of our customer representatives were busy. And then they'd call me from my van driving around town, and I had this giant cell phone, this big brick cell phone, my order pads, my price books, and a calculator on the front seat of my van. It would call them back and would try to make a sale, and normally did, right from the front seat of my van. Wow. That's how it all started. We then had, I'd say, maybe a legitimate office, which was in the back of an alley. Right. which was behind my Laura's showroom. Okay. The alley, as it's known, was Two Brainer Tower, 
so second location. Right. And there were literally rats, disgusting. It was smelly, stinky, and you had to walk through the alley to get to this 800 square foot office with no windows. And of course, the big decision for the two employees that I had at that time was, do I open the door and get all this fumes into our office, or do I keep it closed and get be claustrophobic? Now that was a constant battle they had every day, and then I, I had claustrophobia. Yeah, they went for claustrophobia yeah. most of the time. For sure, that's how the that's how the offices started. Eventually, uh, in two thousand one, I decided that I'm making as much money online as I am in my store, and I'm not working anywhere near as hard. Mm. And it was actually fun to be online, and. Then I, we sold the store and went full-time online in 2001. So what's the, tell me a little bit about the landscape. You're an early adopter. You had one of those big brick cell phones. You were one of the, you know, 1993, you had a website. What was the, the landscape like online at the time? No, certainly no broadband. 1,500 baud modems, so really slow. If you loaded a picture... You would see the picture at the top, and it would just inch down about a quarter of an inch. It would take about two to three minutes to see one photograph. AOL had just started. I remember big news that they had 500,000 subscribers. Prodigy was, was and CompuServe were yeah. pretty big. And uh, people didn't even know what email was at the time. Right. At least I didn't. So that, that's, that's where we were. No caller ID. So Amazon, like what other websites were around when, when you started the, the first e-commerce site um, in 96? I think there was a flower, maybe Pro Flowers, uh -huh. I think may have existed at the time. Yeah. Not a whole lot. I remember on my site, because I had no money, just had the 3000 and I needed to somehow figure out how I could get credibility. So I remember ripping some ads off other people's sites, like a FedEx and the Pro Flowers and some other ads, and banner ads, and put them on my site as if they were paying me to be on the site to get <laughs> credibility. I don't know, I'm even sure they, they linked over to those sites. It just was an image. It was just an image. Yeah. And it was just a way to make it look like there was enough traffic to support somebody paying me to be on there. Early on, I think I read you didn't even have really a shopping cart. Like, how did people actually purchase stuff from the site? Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. Fill in the Whatever blank. It was you all want. text fields. It was text fields, and the columns didn't even add. You had to manually take a, a price matrix from the website and line up the width and the height in the matrix, the intersection of those two of the, of the width and height. Right. Enter that in there actually type in the name of the product, manually add it up, and then submit basically a, a text-filled form. And then I would take the information. I remember I would use a, uh, uh, a, a response to ads, I'm sorry, to a, to a sale that was not automatic. What I would do is when I got home at night, I would see how many sales I had. And at the time, I'd have anywhere from zero to maybe four sales. Right. And I would create all of my order confirmations. And I would write an email that said, uh, Dear Henry, thanks for your purchase of doing a no-brainer blinds. Uh, and then would put their name in various strategic places to make it seem like it was this auto response. Right. And that was it. It was all manual. And eventually, we did get a shopping cart. Isn't it amazing that people would actually, they'd actually make purchases from that? I mean, they'd had to manually put it in and add it up? It was amazing, and nobody actually believed it. I didn't believe it. <laughs> and people said I was an idiot for even trying it. Because nobody's, no one's going right. to measure their own blinds, install their own blinds, and then actually have to enter all this cockamamie information into <laughs> Website. What what made you decide to go against everyone else, and what made you so confident that this was where you needed to be at the time? I had no confidence at all. Oh, you didn't? No. I had no vision as to what this could become. All it was was a little marketing experiment. Mm. I had a website. I knew that I couldn't compete with Home Depot and Lowe's and some of the mail order companies from my high-touch store. So I thought instead of being mail order, which was pretty 
prevalent at the time. I couldn't do a catalog and spend that money. Uh, I had, had no money, no ad budget, as I said. So I figured for $3,000 I can create a website, and that's, that's what I did. It was purely a way to get some incremental dollars and to have a little fun while I was doing it. Yeah. And it just, one step at a time, one sale at a time, started building. It wasn't like I was thinking, I'm going to flip this. I didn't even know what that meant. It wasn't like I was going to eventually sell it. It was just, it was a marketing initiative. Right. That was it. It's amazing, Jay. Um, so your first, when you got fired, you were working at Meineke? It wasn't, yes. did, was it you got fired or they bought, they bought the company and they just let you well, go? Because well, you both. seem like a conscientious person, like they wouldn't just fire someone like you, so. Um, I was related to the owner. Okay. So when they purchased from this owner, they said, we got to get rid of any baggage. And I was considered baggage. Your baggage. Yeah, I, I was you. baggage. The funny part about it is I, I was a CPA at the time. Right. I got a, a BPA in accounting. And so I was VP of, of finance. So this is of the franchise. We weren't in the muffler business. We were in the franchise business. So this company from, from England bought us. I'm doing the due diligence for the company to provide this information. Yeah. And I'm looking at the org chart post acquisition and I wasn't on it. So that was a kind of a sign <laughs> before it even went through right. that I was in trouble. Yeah. So that was uh, that was disturbing. I mean, in growing up, it always seemed like you wanted to be an entrepreneur. When you were growing up, what did you want to be? Did you have an idea? Well, I, I knew in high school that I wanted to own my own business. Okay. I had businesses, yeah. uh, custom t-shirts. I, I paid my way through college by selling t-shirts and also going door to door painting numbers on street curbs. Really? I did that two or three summers and had enough money each summer to pay for college. It was hot. It was, it was <laughs> I didn't know there was a market for that. Yeah, it's, it's not a big market, but it was enough money. At the time, college wasn't that expensive, maybe $2,000, and I made about $2,000. And it, it wasn't like, I didn't really feel like I was an entrepreneur at the time. I didn't have a lot of money. I needed money, so I had to get money. Right, right. And that was a much better way than stealing. <laughs> yes. So, so I, just, I, I did what I had to do to get to school. Yeah. That was really, it wasn't like I felt like I was doing any, any great feat. I just found a, a need and, and, and did it. And filled it, yeah. Kind of like what I'm doing, doing now. Right. Um, you know, what's interesting is looking at your background, you went, you know, to KPMG and, and your mentors told you, you know, if you're going to go into business, you should go into accounting, right? Correct. Do you, going back, would you have gone the same path? Do you agree with that advice that you got at the time? Yes. You do. Well, here, I'm going to answer that first directly. Yeah. Yes, I, I think it's, it was great. Yeah. Now I'm going to answer it in a way, maybe it's more of an existential kind of answer okay. or a philosophical answer. Yeah. Right? I am blessed. I am very grateful for where I am in my life. Yeah. As a person, certainly in my business career. How can I... How can I question right. <laughs> any decision that I've ever made? Yes. And anything that I may have changed, any variable that may have changed, had to have changed something else sure. and would mean that it is very likely that I would not be in the position that I'm, that I'm in. Yeah. So from a philosophical perspective, I question no decision right. that I've ever right. made. Right. You can't because that led you to where you are. Right. Yeah. 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 So let me ask you a different one. With let's say your daughter, son, son-in-law, whoever said, "Okay, they're you know in high school. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to go into business." What yeah. would you tell them to do now? I would I would tell them to do what I did. You I would. would. I, I do think it's 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 important to understand financial yeah financial not just financial statements but understanding numbers so you can talk to people because if you're going to be talking to investors yeah and uh, banks. And wherever you're going to be using money and just learning how to run the business, yeah. if you don't understand a financial statement, accruals, prepaids, just some of the basic stuff, you're, you're pretty much in trouble. You may valuable. know how to sell blinds, but selling blinds and running a business that sells blinds is yeah. two different things. Yeah. 
And I want you to talk a little bit. I want to talk about blinds.com, obviously. But, you know, huge learning when you were at Meineke. And I think it grew from 35 franchises to over 900 locations when you were there. So I was wondering some of the big lessons you learned. And you worked a lot on the targeted marketing programs, right? Uh, that was something I did towards the end when I was getting kind of bored. Okay. But, so, yeah, so the, what are some I, of the lessons? I think the main thing I learned yeah. is that if you have a recipe that works, yeah. then you need to consistently apply it until you figure out that there's maybe even a better way to do it. But don't mess around when you know that something works. Right. So if you've got a system on how to sell blinds, follow it rigorous, rigorously. Yeah. Perfect that system and follow it every single time. You may deviate a little bit, but get back to that path that you know works. Yeah. So we were able to put people who had no business acumen, really, or business experience, and no muffler shop experience at all. These people just wanted to be in business, and they had the money, and we yeah. taught them how to do this. And then it showed me how to leverage information and leverage uh, that kind of experience. So we built, again, from that, those 35 muffler shops to 900 by just following a recipe. Yeah. And so now, as I think about building an organization, I think what is the, what is the best practices that each of my associates should, should follow? And if I can create that, it's my responsibility to provide the right tools, the right processes, give them the right resources, and be able to instruct them, coach them to follow that best practice. Yeah. And if they do, they'll be successful. If they're not successful, it likely is because I hired the wrong person. Because if I've got the right system, I have to take responsibility. Now, there will be people who will not follow a, a recipe. Right. There will be people who have personal reasons and somehow they were on the right path and they, they go off that and you have yeah. to make changes. But generally, that's my responsibility yeah. to create that and follow it. Yeah. And that's what I learned with franchising is replicating successful best practices. Yeah. You know, so, Jay, you know, while there is a recipe, you are very open to employee feedback. And yes. I want you to talk about the call center because you, you took a lot of feedback from the call center, right? Because they were on the, the front lines. What's some of the good feedback you got from the call center? Well, first, not only am I open to feedback, yeah. we encourage it. Right. We have four core values. I'll only talk about one right now. No, go ahead. Yeah, I have it later on to talk about the core values because I know – you know, I want to know why they came about and, and what they are, because that's a big okay. way of, of the way you lead. Yeah. Well, let me answer first your, that question go directly, ahead. then I'll go back to yeah. the, kind of the genesis of the core values. One of them is to be yourself and speak up. Yeah. We don't want people to say what they think I want to hear, because if they do that, I learn nothing. Right. And if I really want to get better, I need as much data as possible. And the people who are talking to customers usually have more data than people who think they know how, what customers want. So not only am I getting their input for buy-in, I'm getting their, their, their input so I can make better decisions. Right. And the more that I can provide that type of autonomy for my associates, the, more happy, the happier they will be because they have now direct control over their own destiny right. because they have... Uh, They've got a, a meaningful say yeah. in the future. So the the core values. We only have four core values. That's yeah. that's number three. Yeah. Number one is to improve continuously. That's when I started the business. It was to improve my marketing. It was just an experiment. Right. And the second is to experiment without fear of failure. Although I will say I hate risk. I'm risk averse. Highly risk averse. Hmm. I don't gamble. I hate to gamble. I was in Monte Carlo, never bet. I go to Las Vegas. I will not gamble. I just can't do I can't put money on something where I know the, the odds are against me. So how do you do that one? That, that one's a tough one for you? Okay. So the, the way you experiment yeah. without fear of failure yeah. is by knowing that the risk of it not working is so small that it has almost no effect on you. Right. So I don't take 
big, big risks. I take a lot of risks, furious experimentation. Right. The, the, we try to measure the rate at which we experiment and try things. Yeah. We even have two giant test tubes here. They're like five foot tall test tubes that have marbles in it. One of the test tubes has marbles for the experiments that we did that did, quote, not work. Wow, I love that. And there's tons of those in there. Yeah. And then there's another one that has experiments that did work, and there aren't that many in there. But we wow. conspicuously show both test tubes filled with marbles mm. because we are, we are passionate about illustrating our propensity to and yeah. insistence on experimentation. I love that. Before you do the next one, what's an experiment that you thought weren't sure it was working or the company and it worked really well? And what was one that didn't work to give people an idea of what, what you tested? Well, one experiment was that started off not working that well, but ended up being great is, and this is at the time when a lot of people did not give very good satisfaction guarantees. Ours was good, but it wasn't like for any reason we'll give you your money. It wasn't back. a wow type of... It wasn't yeah. a wow. It was, yeah. it was a solid guarantee. Right. But then we said, even if you mismeasure, if you mismeasure for any reason, we will refund you and we'll give you your, uh, a new blind, that made a huge difference. That mm. increased average order value, that increased lift, it's conversion a big, rate. It seems everything. like a big risk, right? It would seem like a big risk yeah. to us, yeah. but we tested it with different, with different types of language on just a few products. We didn't do the whole site and publicize it. Right. We just tested it on a few yeah. and, and like a good direct marketer would do. Right. So we tried it and then continued and leverage that. Yeah. Oh God, there's so many things that. What's work. one you're like? Oh, this is a sure thing. This is gonna work, and it just bombed. It just didn't work at all. Uh, I can't. I can't think of anything offhand. This is a sure thing because we never think anything okay. to do is a sure thing. But I remember we we tried this. In retrospect, it was a pretty stupid idea, but we did it. We advertised on coat hangers where there were ads inside the coat hangers that dry cleaners would just give away. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We did that. That was complete bomb. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure we had one sale from it and it's, we spent a lot of money on it. That was a pretty that was a pretty dumb idea. But we were willing to try it. Hey, if it sits on people's shelves for a long time, who knows? But you you tried it. Doesn't yeah. work. Right. So improve continuously, experiment with, without fear of failure, be yourself yeah. and speak up on the fourth one. Have fun. Just enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. That's yeah. it. I have a lot of fun at, at work. My, my wife says uh, when Jay goes to work, he's off to his playground. And that's the way I feel about it. Yeah. Talk about enjoying the ride when you're doing the seven days a week with the kids, like looking back on that, that's like now it may be, I would think it's maybe easier compared to the days when you were <laughs> having to go into customers' homes every day, you had three kids, balancing that. Yeah. Talk about that part of things and what was going through your mind with, well, with that. Well, that. that wasn't fun. Right. That was not enjoyable. Right. That was survival. Right. Uh, now we're building something of consequence. We're transforming the way people buy product. And that is fun. Yeah. So when you're when you're actually improving and helping everybody around you improve, and you're experimenting, like an inventor, and things work and some don't work, and you're measuring all that, and sometimes you succeed and sometimes you don't, but you're yeah. learning from every encounter that you have. Yeah. That is how we have fun. Right. And that and then besides that, we've got all the the ping pong tables and the foosball and. Crazy stuff around the office. Really crazy. It's like a. It looks like a. Um, a game a room or something. Yeah. yeah. I ask that because someone listening may be at that point, right? They may be just working seven days a week. How did you stay in? Maybe have multiple kids. How did you stay sane and juggle all that at the time? Well, I'm not sure. I I, I was sane at the. Time. You were insane. Yeah. Yeah, and and that was a time when when the third child was born, my wife actually quit. And she started uh, staying at home. Uh, unfortunately, right after that, when I started the business, and this is sad, uh, she she passed away. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. And I that did, was in 2002, the year after I started going full time online. Oh my god! So 
that was um, that was pretty horrible. That's the worst. And thing. I had to really figure out what was important to me, what my core values are, what was happiness, and unfortunately, it took that for me to become more introspective mm. and philosophical about what life is and how I even define my success. And um, that's how I, I, how I got through that. And that's how I was, figured out that the core values are important. It's not just something that's the soft stuff that you talk about. And it actually does drive you. And if you know that you're on the path of what is important to you, it will be fun. Yeah. Because you're doing things that are important and that you feel like you're transformative in what you're doing. Yeah. And you have a, a group, a team that's helping you do that, that's, that's powering you to do things that you couldn't do on your own. That, that's in, enormously yeah. fun. Yeah. Teamwork is, is way f much more fun than doing it on your own. Yeah. James. So I think about this, the seven days. That was not fun. Yeah. When my wife was sick and she ultimately passed away, that sucked. That's horrible. Yeah. And now, um, you know, I'm I'm blessed, and and still obviously very sad about what happened in 2000. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry to hear that. It's ugh, devastating, and that overpowers anything that could be going on for any. Like, really gives perspective on anything that could be going on, business wise or anything for people. Yeah. It does create perspective. So um, if I've got a lot of uh, emotional intelligence, and people say I do, uh, it's that, some of it derives from that because right. you know, what, is, what is, uh, is losing money or not making a sale right. compared to losing your, your wife that right. you've been married to for 26 years? Yeah. At that point, do you decide, do you, were you making, a, was there a decision to be made whether you sell the business and go, you know, maybe take a job so you can be with the kid? I mean, that's, I can't even imagine having to handle all that. Was there a decision or did, there was no decision? It was like just forge ahead. You know, I've, I've, I've never been asked that, that question and in retrospect, it never even occurred to never me occurred that to I would not continue doing what I was doing. Yeah. It was, we were developing momentum. And because things were out of control, this was something that I could control. Mm. Even though it was early in the formative years, yeah. because I was in charge, I can't imagine that I would give up control I see. and allow my life to be battered around any more than it had already been. So You just grab the reins, you're like, I, I have control of this, and I'm going to take control of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I did. Yeah. And it was my three children who are now, at the youngest is 26 and 30 and 33. One 33-year-old daughter has two children. One is named Naomi. Mm. Um, and uh, my son is, they're, they're due in, in a few months. Congratulations. First grandson. Wow. So, you know. It, a lot of gratefulness. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, the, in essence, what that did was that if I had this perspective, of making myself better and making my associates and my team better, I realized that my definition of success was actually being in the process of getting better yeah. and making people around me get better. Yeah. And that's actually the purpose of our company. The stated purpose right. of Blinds.com is to help people become better, yeah. better than what they ever believe possible. Yeah. And it stems with the support of those four core values. Yeah. So when you've got people who are trying to help each other get better, who are looking to make sure they, they get better, yeah. you have an organization that aspires to be better and to be transformative and to support others. And when you have when people feel like you really are supporting you, supporting them, and that they trust you that you really care about that because they know that is not just a goal, it's what drives you. Yeah. It's, it's really a core value. Yeah. It's way easier to lead and to get people to do what you'd like them to do because, well, you're asking for their input. You're saying you want them to be better. What could be more supportive than that? I and love the yeah. I love the visual of the test tubes. How did you think of that? I don't know. That's was, great. Uh, because it really, I like can visualize, you know, and it tells people 
they can make mistakes and fail and it's okay. Right. Yeah. I think we have our marketing department set up like a laboratory. Yeah. It has this, it's got uh, it, pictures of inventors and it's got a, a marketing periodic table that looks, that is pretty fun that we, that we created. There's white coats, test tubes and things. So it was just natural to create giant test tubes. Right. And do that. We're expanding uh, to uh, another floor, and on this next floor, we're going to make the test tubes even bigger and make it more conspicuous. Take it out of the marketing department and put it where everybody can see. Yeah, it. yeah. Because it's so core to any business to experiment uh, yeah. relentlessly and not be afraid of trying something else. Yeah. Um, uh, talk about so you get fired. You go in and you and your wife have a couple stores, then you consolidate to just e-commerce. So at that point, what are there, how many staff are there and what, is, what does the company look like at that point? Well, I had the two in, in, in the alley. Right. My wife was home. Yeah. And she was already sick at that time. Right. Cancer. So uh, she's at home. We've got our three children at home. The youngest at the time was 10. And uh, we then had two employees in the alley. Yeah. And then when we went to Three Brainer Tower, okay. which was really a, a real office above a trophy shop. No rat. No rats okay. at all. We hired seven people. What, did you, what were they doing? They were on the phones. Okay. That's all they did. But again, we weren't spending any money on advertising. It was just people answer the phone. Right. And that was one of my big fears is that I'm an expert at, at blinds and selling blinds and understanding what customers need. Right. How was I going to impart that information and share that yeah. with all these other people? Yeah. And I had no idea how to hire at the time. I had no idea about structured training or anything. But I just, I was lucky because I was a first mover and no one else was in the space. So there was no pressure to do something fast or to spend money. Mm -hmm. So, and I was naive enough to believe I could do anything. Right. And therefore, I I tried everything. Right. Because there were no really bad habits yet or limitations on what I believed was possible, because nobody was doing it, and that actually was a, an advantage. My naivety gave me the advantage of not being constrained by uh, knowledge and wisdom. Right. How did you train them though? Because you did come from the systems franchise model. How did you end up training those people? So you'd think I would have taken some of that and, and <laughs> done that well. <clears throat> I would teach them about, about blinds and then I did probably the worst thing I could pro probably do and that was coach them while they were on the phone. And they were so annoyed with me. I was horrible. <laughs> they were, I'd hear them say something, I'd say, put them on hold. <laughs> And then it would tell them, no, you need to say it this way. So I was training on the job yeah. while they were on the phone. And I, there's a couple, the, the original two people from the alley still work for me. Really? Sharon and Ann. Are you yeah, serious? They're still, yeah, they're still here. Wow. And they, they would, they'll tell people that I've completely transformed. I'm uh, so much more enlightened now than when I was. I was pretty much an asshole at the time and had no clue as to what to do. They were in tears at times when they were on really? the phone, and 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 now, um, not at all. I think Jay, the new training should be: you get back that office in the alley, and anyone you hire has to go in there. If those people lasted this long, you need to put them in there for like a year in that alley, answering phones. It's like and a then, boot camp, right? Yeah. And then they could graduate to the. Well, funny enough, when we. When we hire people on the first day of training, yeah. we take them to the alley. You do? Okay. We actually do take them to the awesome. alley. Awesome. Yeah. We don't have class in the alley, but we, we show them where my house used to be, where the garage was. Yeah. We take them to the first office, at, which is actually Three Brainer Tower, the legitimate office. Right. And we take them um, inside the alley okay. and talk about the history so that they have some idea that this company now a part of Home Depot doing hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. didn't always, wasn't always like right. that. We want somebody to have some of that. It grounds them a bit. 
Yeah, we want them to feel so that they're not arrogant and they think this is just what how it always was. Right. Yeah. We we built this. Right. I love that. Yeah. So, but that training obviously worked. Even though you're stopping them, put them on hold, say this, that that worked at the time, it, right? It worked at the time. Right. But I didn't. It it wasn't a whole lot of money. <laughs> if we did five thousand dollars a week, that was pretty good. And then. I think that year, I don't know, we did probably a million and a half our first year, and then I made an acquisition from a company who was now doing three million, who leapfrogged us, in St. Augustine, Florida, and that was actually how we started in 2001, with our million and a half, their three, so we were doing four and a half million dollars. Yeah. So, That's I had a big virtually jump. no inventory. I had no inventory. I had virtually no overhead, no advertising. So it was all pretty much incremental profit. You mean they would drop ship? The companies would drop ship? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We still do that. Yeah. yeah. Most companies in the blinds business don't make their product. They have yeah, yeah. the big manufacturers make it and drop ship it right. right to the customer. So we had no receivables. So I didn't have to worry about collection. Right. People would pay in advance. We'd make it. Yeah. It would take about a few days to two weeks for them to make it, drop ship it to the customer, get 30 days payment. So you get cash up front, right. and then about 45 days later, you pay the bill. Right. That's a good model. Yeah, and a great model. Somebody <laughs> who's trying to keep things as much a no-brainer as possible, I didn't have to be that smart. I just had to be, I just had to show up, really, and, and take a couple of steps, and then look at see what happened and take a couple more yeah. steps well, i think you're being modest on that but the I really that's really how i feel i'm not i don't think it's false modesty i know over time i've probably gotten a little smarter about it but i really think that the success is just being willing to take some steps yeah. and being super attentive to what you're doing yeah. and and adjusting yeah. and not being arrogant to feel yeah. like everything you do you think is right. Yeah. In fact, you do what you believe is right with the idea that it is most likely going to be wrong yeah. and looking and taking in all the input you can to make it better. Yeah. That's, that's in a nutshell, experimenting without yeah. fear, improving continuously, listening, and that was fun for me. Yeah. So here's where I'm going to disagree with them, and I think you're being modest, because when you sell for 14 years, I mean, one of the re ways when I, when I was doing the research, some of the things on your website come directly from your experience of grinding out 14 years selling. For instance, you have a feature on there that that's a tab says purpose, <coughs> right? You probably wouldn't have discovered that, I'm assuming, if you hadn't for 14 years been selling. So talk about some of the decisions on why your yeah. website looks the way it does. Well, that, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. When people are buying a, a, a blind, it's actually a pretty logical decision. It's not like they're buying draperies, which are fairly illogical. They're like for look, like, yeah, yeah for, I mean, right. aesthetics. I mean, it's, it's pure for, for look and aesthetics. When right. you buy a blind, you're buying it for privacy, or you're buying it for light control, yes. maybe some aesthetics, insulation, durability, right. and things like that. Yeah. So if you understand what the needs are right. and what they're trying to achieve, yeah. it's much easier to narrow it down. Yeah. So if a person says, I need it to be dark, I'm a fireman, I, I sleep during the day, and right. uh, you need it to be yeah. pitch dark. So Hence that's on right. purpose, darken a room is a choice. Darken a room, exactly. Right. If you're looking to reduce glare for your TV, here are the products that do that. Yeah. And you discover that because only because you knew the customers and what they yeah. wanted. You, you, you really don't sell by giving features, but by knowing what the benefit is. I mean, that, all, all good salespeople know that. Yes. So all I'm doing is saying, here's the yeah. benefit of this product. Yeah. Is, and therefore, is this product aligned with what you're trying to achieve? Yeah. And we, we've developed something called the Blind Finder, which is a design assistant, where you answer four or five questions. Yeah. At the end of the process, voila, here is the product or two that would be best for you. Yeah. Like, how important is light control to you? How important is this, all the things that I just mentioned before? Right. And by answering those questions, you can distill it down to the right, uh, to the best right. products. Right. I think that gets lost when people... 
you know, that's such a good point. You want to sell the benefits, not the features. Because oftentimes we just immediately jump to the features and we don't worry or sell the benefits, which is no, what people care about. People don't buy features, they buy benefits. Yeah. What will this do for you? And that's what they want to know. Yeah. And so, Jay, at the time, that acquisition, that acquisition is a huge decision, right? I mean, that's not just like, oh, I'm going to acquire this company. What makes you at that time decide it's time for me to make a big move? Well, this was 2001. Yeah. While I was, my, okay, my wife's still alive. I still, still have the store. Um, going all around town like a crazy guy. Right. And w the way it actually worked was... Joe from St. Augustine sent an email out to a bunch of people, including Home Depot, I might add. I, re I still have a copy of that email okay. and said, hey, I'm, I'm just looking to sell my business to anybody interested, and I'm going to sell like to the first bidder. Well, I actually did take the step and flew out to St. Augustine. Wow. He was doing his business out of his house with his family, yeah. and I said, okay. I'm going to do this full time, and that's when I decide. That's when I decided to sell the the business and go full time online. Yeah. So really, when I went full time online, I was automatically doing four and a half million instead of the one and a half that I was that I was doing by myself. Yeah. It was seemed like a pretty easy decision. The really? amount that he was asking for was doable. Yeah. How do you finance that? I mean, unless you have I, cash sitting in a briefcase somewhere. I did not have. Okay. I did have friends and family helped me with some of it, and he financed his payables. Mm. And that's how we did it. So some seller financing that we paid off yeah. over like 90 days, had those investors, and that, so I've, I've had investors ever since day one. Yeah. So I've had to be attentive to that. And in the back of my mind, I probably knew that one day I'd be selling the company, because that's probably what they wanted, although they really didn't. What they wanted was just cash. Yeah. They wanted money, and what they did was they wanted me to basically drain the company all the time and distribute every Make month. Make distributions. Yeah, every month. And I wanted to take the money and put it back into the company right. to build something of significance. Right. So we agreed that we would keep a um, third of the money for taxes, a third of the money we would distribute, and a third of the money we would oh. keep in the business. Yeah. And eventually we, we grew. Now, that's a slow way to grow and it's a safe way to grow but there wasn't a whole lot of outside pressure from competition so that's what we did was that a t was that a tough sell to get those investors on board i mean what's that conversation like because this is family and friends right and the potential is you could friends lose. okay uh, <laughs> like, we can keep them guy. out of thanksgiving table yeah <laughs> it's um this is, there was one person who, who had a pretty good inkling as to what the internet was going to be like. Okay. He drove a lot of that. I see. He found somebody else. I also had a supplier who was already supplying me, and they put up the bulk That makes of sense. Yeah. It was a strategic investment. Yeah, that's smart. They even gave me a computer, so I didn't have to buy it. He says, yeah, here, just take, take one of our computers. Yeah. So that was a, about a $2,000 computer. And uh, so I had the computer, had a table, and some chairs, and two employees. So that's, that's how it worked. So is the next major milestone purchasing blinds.com in 2004? Well, with, with that St. Augustine company, yeah. they had a license for the name blinds.com. Oh, they did? Yes. Oh. And the, the guy who owned it, a guy in New Jersey, never launched a website called Blinds.com. So the, the, the company from St. Augustine, which was called Blinds Wholesale, had all the type-in traffic for Blinds.com redirect to Blinds Wholesale. We were paying some really small amount for a lot of traffic, and we were able to convert it. The person who owned it, this was like free money for him. It was great. It was a great deal for him. It was a great deal for us. Eventually, I contacted the guy and said, you know, why don't I just pay you a lot of money and not do this once a month royalty? Right. And we came to terms and bought Blinds.com because I wasn't going to launch Blinds.com on what I considered a land lease. Someone's, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't own the property, but I, here was I was starting a, a business he on it. He could yank it out from under you. Yeah, you never knew. 
So it wasn't this lifetime perpetual license. Yeah. So we ended up buying it, and that's when we started a no-brainer. Well, no-brainer blinds was 1996, and it wasn't until 2004, right. uh, eight years later, that Blinds.com launched. Was that a hard negotiation to actually get that? Because he's seeing a residual income every month. So, but this he's waiting years to get to get the money that he ended up getting. Right. It was. And what was great about it is there was this other company much further along in the mail order business that also wanted it. And the guy and it would pay a lot more than we were willing to pay. Mm. He wouldn't sell it to this other guy because really? he was such a jerk and he was just known in the industry as a jerk and he didn't want him to have it. Right. He says, I will not allow that guy to have this website. Right. And he says, I like you guys. I'm going to let you buy it. Wow. And if that hadn't happened... We wouldn't be t having this, this discussion right now, that's for sure. I don't know about that, but um, so that's, that's big. What was the next major milestone in, so you make the acquisition. You have now owned blinds.com. Um, but we also made another acquisition in 2005 of mm -hmm. another competitor, and that helped. When I made that acquisition, we were at that time doing about 15 million. They were doing 18 million, so we're up to 33 million. Yeah. And... That gave me the critical mass to begin hiring really good management, managerial, like C-level people. Yeah. When I hired my first chief marketing officer yeah. and I got a, a COO at the time. So that was, that was a really important, that was a turning point for us. Yeah. Because there was enough business and profit to afford the kinds of people who could do things that I didn't know how to do and could do it a lot better than I could yeah. and do it full time. What did the organization look like? Because how you're taking in all these companies and kind of mushing them together, how do you decide who to keep, who to do? You mushing leave them is as a, a little too uh, <laughs> pejorative. Do you, do we you, had we were like Procter and Gamble, okay. smaller. We had like all, all these different soap soap brands. Yeah. On the shelf, you keep them kind of separately. We had multiple websites. Yeah. All existing, all with uh, shelf uh, shelf space. Yeah. On, in the search engines, and they were all different products, different pricing, gotcha. different look and feel, different marketing segments, yeah. although I will say that loosely about marketing segments. They were basically just existed, and it wasn't like it was a, deter it was a predetermined market segment that right. we were trying to appeal to, right. but they did because they looked differently. Yeah. And the people in our contact center, which we called the customer engagement center, right. because we don't, we don't transact with customers, we engage with our customers. We yeah. call it the CEC, the Customer Engagement Center. Yeah. So in the CEC, uh, they'll answer the phone from all the different websites. Mm -hmm. So you have a centralized call center that you use? Yes. Okay. Right outside my, okay. my office. Yeah, we, that's a, that is a core capability that we have yeah. that we do not want to or will not outsource. Yeah. We have real experts on the phone who now have a legitimate training program yeah. so that they can ask the right questions, right. figure out what the needs are, right. and provide. One of the ways they get compensated is by, by our quality control department yeah. which listens to calls and ensures that the product that they're recommending was derived by asking the right questions right. to understand what the needs were yeah. and then matching up the product that matches their needs. Yeah. And if they don't do that, they get dinged. Right. Because we want to make sure they're not pushing the wrong product. Yeah. You want, want the customer really happiness. really get yeah. the right solution. Yeah. You want the customer happiness first. So going from your training of pausing them on hold, telling them what to say, now what's the training process look like for the call center? Now it's, it's pretty rigorous. We have two-week classroom. We have then a, uh, they go from there, once they graduate, at their pace, they go into what we call Academy Bay. Academy Bay is where they have coaches right by them where they start taking a few calls yeah. a day and their each call is monitored and graded yeah. and assessed. And then over time they get more and more calls and then they go back into training. Yeah. And from there they they graduate usually in about two to three months before they're really able to go on the the floor yeah. in the CEC on their own 
And then even after that happens, we have a skill development department and that mm. department, their whole job is to listen to calls, grade those calls and coach yeah. people so that they can do the things that we were just talking about. Yeah. So it, it's, the, the, it never ends. The training, the coaching, the skill development yeah. never ends. Yeah. They get a master's in call center. I feel sorry for your competition, honestly, with, with, with that program. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing when you hear our people on the phone yeah. and you listen to competitors on the phone, there's night and day. And people end up saying, wow, that was, that was surprisingly easy. And yeah. I was actually treated with courtesy and respect. And they were listening to me and they asked good follow-up questions. That's Imagine that. That's right? what we teach. Right. That's one of the reasons why Home Depot bought us. Not just because we yeah. were killing it in blinds, yeah. but we have these systems and we have this culture that they believe that we could then potentially integrate into the whole Home Depot yeah. system. Yeah. I mean, and Jay, customer experience is huge for you. And I remember reading somewhere, you always are thinking of how do you produce a wow for the customer? So what are yes. some things that, I mean, obviously the call center is huge. What are things you implement that creates a wow? The, the, the CEC, the, the Customer Engagement Center, yeah. these days, most uh, contact centers are so poor that you don't even have to be that good to get a wow. Like, wow, you actually did call me back. I wasn't expecting that. Or, wait a minute, you, you called me by the right name. Uh, you understood me, and when you didn't, you asked for clarification. Little things like that. It's yeah. just courtesy and respect right. and being attentive. Yeah. It's just... That's sort of sad that that's a wow it, experience. It is right? sad. Yeah. We don't, we're really not that great. We're just so much better than a lot of other people. Yeah. You I mean, pay attention to the details. Yes. Yeah. You pay attention to what the customer really needs. Yeah. And you just do it with intent. Yeah. Now, we're not, we, not everybody does it. and We don't always... Uh, live up to our to our goals, and then we we work harder to make those people better. And if if that doesn't happen, then you have to make a change. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about marketing. That's really I mean you you helped a lot with the key and the marketing. So I want you to set the stage. In I think videos. I want to talk about all the marketing because you do radio, TV, but the videos in '97. You filmed something in your bathroom. Yes. Oh. Back, back in the day, uh, I was doing social media and I was using videos and reciprocal uh, links, all that stuff. I, needed, I thought it would make it much easier for people to understand how to install a blind if they saw a video of it. Makes sense. So we're yeah. using quick time. I mean, that's pretty logical. Yeah. And we have hundreds of videos that we now produce in our own studio. Yeah. But at the time, I had a videographer who filmed me as the installer in my bathroom okay. uh, installing a blind. The videos, they're pretty hilarious. Are they're they out there? Are they out there? Yeah. Are they on your site? I, I can, I can, I'll send you those links. Wanna, they're not on the site. I want to put one of those on there. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll show you what they're like. They're about 15 seconds. Okay. And the instructions are, uh, your blind comes with all the, all the brackets and instructions. Take it out of the box, put the brackets up, Snap in the blind, it's a no-brainer. That was, that was the whole video. Right. <laughs> but the, you could actually tell how to do it from that. And you'll, you'll, when you see it, that will be me in the background pulling up the, the shade. And the announcer was the videographer. So he edited it, he shot it, and was the announcer of these, of these videos. I think I've got three that I can find. That's great. Are, there, are they on YouTube or on your site? Or I just, they're nowhere. Oh, they're nowhere. I just have them in my own okay. library. Okay. I want to see them, yeah. I'll, I'll send them to you. Bob Vila style videos or something. Yes. Yes. Uh, um, but it was important to do that. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's ahead of its time too. I mean, 97, who's, who's shooting videos? Right. I mean. And we had referrals. We had uh, ratings. We had social media where people would go on to uh uh, bulletin boards are what they were called, and I would have having my my signature, no brainer blind CEO, right, right. and people would ask a question about blinds, and I would answer it. Yeah, like forums Hopefully. and bulletin boards. Yeah, there were forums. Yeah, 
but they were really called like all dot consumers or something like that. Early social media. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Deja News is what I used, I think, to ferret out those different bulletin boards and forums. Yeah. yeah. That was how I did the advertising. And I would go into one of those, and I probably found two or three that had actually a decent number of questions, which would mean three a day or something like that. Right. And answer those, and I'd be scouring and try to get in there before anybody else could do that. Right. That's how I advertise. Yeah. That was, that's really social media. Yeah. So I know like the majority of the customers come from people who are happy rebuying or referring other people. What about from the marketing side? Um, you did you'd SEO, you did a lot of SEO early on because I read like you had one of the yeah. top SEO people ever, He's Danny Sullivan. He's the top Sullivan. guy. Right. Uh, his name is Danny How Sullivan. How did you even meet him? I mean, uh, search engine uh, watch, Danny Sullivan. He's like the guru of uh, right. search engine. He actually did my my uh, my search engine marketing. He actually right. personally did it. Right. He, I, how did I find out about him? Is he local in, in Dallas? No, he actually lives in England. Oh. I think he probably still lives in England. The time he, he did good him. SEL. That's probably how you found out. <laughs> <laughs> probably so. There was a guy called Eric, Eric Ward, who was really big in publicity. Right. I found him online to do publicity. Yeah. He probably told me about Danny. And then, there was another guy, Nick Usborne, who is a copywriter? And I know. Really I've I've interviewed Nick. Yeah. Nick, yeah. Yeah. So ask yeah. Nick about us. So he's written about me. Yeah, yeah. And he's a great guy. I think he's in Canada. Yeah, I think I'm you're not right. Sure. But he was. That was back in the really early days. He's a great copywriter. Days. Yeah. So it was Nick, Danny, and Eric were my three mentors of online, and there wasn't really much of anybody else at mm. the time. Yeah. So radio and TV. What did you do? Because radio worked for you too, right? We're still doing a lot of radio. We've been doing radio for about six, seven years. Okay. And so, that's, uh, it's hard to measure, but uh, we're, we're able to measure it. And so many people now, over consistent, many, many years, say, oh, yeah, we heard this guy talk about you and that guy. It's mostly uh, uh, radio host endorsed, but we do a lot of others. Yeah. I get people, uh, for, the, for the bonus spots, I do those reads. So people say, hey, I heard you on the radio. I got... I just yesterday write me and say, I heard you on the Howard Stern show. Oh, really? Because you were one of the commercials? Yeah. That's great. That, that is funny. The first time I, I knew we were on Howard Stern uh, was when my son said his friends were telling him that they kept hearing me on Howard Stern. And I didn't even know. <laughs> That's great. So that yeah. works. And TV, does that work at all? TV, uh, TV works pretty well. Uh, we're, we were always experimenting with that. Uh, pay-per-click advertising, AdWords, Bing, things like that. We, we do a lot of that. But over 60% of our business comes from happy customers, repeat and referred right, customers. Right. And if we were to have to buy traffic, then we would not make money. Right. You can't buy traffic and be in business. You have to do a good job yeah. and uh, to stay in business yeah. And in order to make to make money. Yeah. So when does Home Depot into the picture? Because you, they, you, they acquired us in 2014. Right. So it's, it'll be three years this January. Did you have some kind of, because I read in an interview somewhere, this is before you got acquired and it says, we just created a partnership with some big public companies. It launched two weeks ago. I can't really talk about it. This yeah. was, this was maybe, I'm, I'm thinking it was three years prior to Home Depot. Well, eventually you. you probably talked about it. We were we were selling. Well, no, I mean at the time for, you couldn't talk about Sears. it. Yeah, we had done a, uh, a powered by a white label cart to cart integration for Sears. Okay, helping them sell blinds. Right. We also did sell blinds for Wayfair, which right now is is huge. That was in their in the, in the beginning, and those were great proofs of uh, concept for us right? because when Home Depot and some other big stores came to us and started looking at us, right. the fact that we were proven to be able to support yeah. public company, Sears, yeah. and an emerging public company, yeah. that was Wayfair, huge. who was known for their IT, right. that gave us a lot of credibility. That was the way we were intending to grow, by 
using that model for being that center engine for other big retailers. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons why Home Depot came to us and said, you know what? We don't want you doing that for them. We want you doing that for us. Right. And it, the company was making a lot of money. It was growing at very high rates of growth. And uh, we thought it was being run pretty well. It's being run better now as being part of Home Depot. Yeah. We know a lot more about ourselves than we did then. But we were highly successful and growing very rapidly. And it yeah. was real fun. But we weren't at the time looking to sell. Yeah. They came so to they, you. They came to us. Okay. Yeah. We had, we had no book, anything. We, when they came, they said, are you interested in talking? We said, sure, we'll, we'll talk to you. So they and made an offer you couldn't refuse. Yes, they did. Yeah. Actually, I did refuse the first offer. You did? Okay, that's smart. <laughs> <laughs> it, we eventually were able to work out something that was uh, not only financially uh, acceptable, but because it's Home Depot and because our, our, our mission was always to take our platform and to sell not just blinds but other products right. that were very difficult to buy yeah. and transform those transactional transactions into experiences yeah. that were surprisingly easy, we were going to then have to acquire a company in order to do that with some other category. Yeah. Now we're taking that platform and working with Home Depot and leveraging it across the enterprise, which is very fun for me because now I'm an entrepreneur and in a corporate executive, right. side by side. Uh, one is a little more fun than the other. But <laughs> we'll take our guess which one is that. Yeah. But it's still intriguing and quite rewarding to yeah. be working with super smart people who are dominating, and to be able to do something and leverage something far beyond anything that I and any of my team yeah. could have done on our own. Yeah. We liken it to Iron Man where we consider ourselves Tony Stark right, right. and Jarvis is Home Depot yeah. in the suit. Jay, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so how long does that take once they decide to make an offer to actually closing like with paperwork and negotiation, how long does it take for when you enter in discussion to them actually finalizing everything? It happened within uh, the whole thing from the initial paperwork to the, the fully negotiated uh, purchase agreement with everything signed. It happened in about four or five months, including, wow, that's all, the, quick. including all the due diligence. That seems quick. It was very quick. They were determined... And we had a very clean operation. Yeah. So there wasn't a whole lot. I guess of your background's in accounting, right? So like. <laughs> so well, I had good people. Yeah. Yeah. And and things were organized, and we were doing well. There and there was no skeletons. Yeah. So it was a pretty clean. You know, they had, I think, over a hundred people in our in our data room looking around, asking a lot of nosy questions, but good questions that they they right. needed to ask. Right. Right. But we we had good answers. So they were determined to do it. They wanted to get it done, yeah. and uh, we wanted to. And there were there were instances where there were some tricky things along the way. But right. when you have two parties both intent on getting something right. done, right. it seems like you can almost always work out a solution that's good for yeah. everybody. Yeah, we were always able to do it. And when the people who were we were working with, a guy by the name of George. Uh, he and I had a really good relationship, and we were able to work through almost everything. The attorneys had had good, solid intent, yeah. And every all the negotiations were done to make the deal work, so everybody yeah. would be happy. Yeah. And nothing has changed in the way I've worked with right. them in the past, and what how I'm working with them now. I'm still feeling the really good intentions. It just takes longer for things to happen than it did right. back in the past, but. Ultimately, it seems like it's uh, working out. It's been three years. Yeah. What should people think about or look at, look out for when being acquired or making an acquisition since you've been through this? And you've made acquisitions too, obviously. We've made four acquisitions. Yeah. I think the question of culture and control yeah. are the big things that people worry about. Yeah. And in our case, it was not a roll-up. It was not buying us 
to m meld us into this organization. Like my wrong term of mushing it together. Yes. 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 It wasn't mushing yes. it together. It wasn't a, it wasn't a mush. Yes. It was <laughs> It wasn't a meld of, of right. things to, to drive cost out. I got you. Certainly, you're always looking to drive cost out. Yeah. But it was to take our, our culture, our capabilities, the technology that we had built on our own. That yeah. technology was really the first reason they came to us. Really? Because we had built this, this web commerce platform yeah. in-house that was product agnostic. It was not only just killing it in blinds, but it could apply. We built it specifically mm. to, to not be hard-coded for blinds. Yeah. And then they saw the culture, they saw the contact center, and uh, so for us, it was, are they really wanting to do all these other things? And then it's about how much cash do you get versus right. stock, and if you're, I guess if you get enough cash, the other stuff doesn't matter. Right, right. And I'm not saying I got enough cash, and I'm not saying anything about my own personal situation, Right. but I would... If you're selling your, your business, the amount of cash you get is very important. Yeah, for sure. And the control that you have and whether if you're going to be, if it is a mush kind of deal, <laughs> right. then you know that whatever culture you have, it's going to be gone. Yeah. Because it can't work. Right. The, the acquirer's culture is what must prevail. And you have to blend into it. And if you think that's not going to happen, then you're being naive. Right. And that's why most entrepreneurs that sell their company don't last more than three months, right? Sometimes a week, yeah, and certainly no more, no longer than than a year. Yeah, it's very rare. I've been told a handful of people will be there three years, right. and I I'm still feeling a you're lot feeling, of energy, good. a lot of opportunity. So global custom commerce is the platform, right? How many developers? Well, that's the name of the company. Oh, that's the name of the company. The company I, name is Global Custom Commerce. I gotcha. We just happen to have as a website, Blinds.com. Gotcha. We say Blinds.com because it's easier to say. You don't have to go through the whole... I'd say it because there's a technology behind what you're running. How many developers do you need on staff to construct? We have 65 people in our IT department. Okay. They're yeah. not all engineers. Yeah. They're not all developers. Yeah. QA. Yeah. VAs, we've got uh, network people, we've got help desk. Yeah. So we talked before we started, um, before we record about people ask you why you stay on for so long as the okay. CEO. Well, the, to kind of bring it all together now, yeah. if my core values truly are to experiment without fear, to improve continuously, yeah. to speak up and to have fun, then I have just gone to the biggest arena for that I could possibly imagine. Right. I'm not going to start my own company when I have the opportunity to impact a $100 billion company right. and to do it in a way that's particularly hard. And if I'm already financially secure, I don't have to worry as much about the politics. I don't have to worry about if somebody is upset with me and I don't have the job, that's fine. So what that enables me to do is to truly speak up yeah. with deference and respect, yeah. but only say those things that I truly believe are in the best interest of the enterprise. Right. And when they know I'm coming from that, I get to experiment, I get to try new things and do things that really in, in retail have not been done before. Yeah. And because they're particularly hard and very challenging, it's fun. And yeah. we're all trying to do things that have not been done before. Yeah. So this is a perfect place to do it. Yeah. What's the skill set you've had to develop as a CEO that's different from the entrepreneur side of things? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, w when you're an entrepreneur, you're basically a product expert on how to sell and service that product. Yeah. Now you have to learn how to create a business. It's like you can be a really great cook, but not necessarily run a restaurant. Right. So I've had to learn how to run a restaurant, yeah. not cook. Yeah. So that means how to hire how to develop organizations, uh, how to uh, how to train, how yeah. to uh, establish an environment, culture, yeah. establish a vision, how to communicate the vision, how to execute on it, capacity analysis, all the things that you've got to do to actually run yeah. uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of a business. Right. Right. And my job now has changed this year versus what it was last year. 
and I will, will believe and that that job will continue to change because now a lot of my job is an ambassador job where I have to make sure that the vision that we see is communicated broadly and clearly among yeah. 8,000 people that are just in the the headquarters wow. of, uh, of Home Depot. Yeah. There's another almost 400,000 associates in the stores. Yeah. yeah that's, I, that's a lot of what I'm doing. Now I see the theme. Like, I, re, you know, our, I encourage anyone to check out the articles. You wrote an article, a lot of articles on Inc. And a lot of them have a theme of hiring. I think one was on why hiring is like making trail mix or something like that. Yeah. Right? Yes. Exactly. Everything that I think about is about creating the right system, the right process, yeah. the right environment, and then hiring the right people that fit within the type of environment that you want, yeah. and being very clear about the direction that you want to go in, and making sure everybody knows what their role is, and what, what that long-term role is, and how their short-term job today uh, is tied to that. Yeah. And as we've gotten bigger, it's been much harder for me to do it, and I've actually not done a good job of that over the last year because we have now 350 people and it's just it's just impossible yeah. to be able to do what I used to do and I just hired a chief people officer a few months ago and he's gonna shore up a lot of the deficiencies that I've got in time and he's got the expertise and he's trained in organizational design and communication he's he's fantastic and we're a better company because now he's shoring up my weakness of not being able to do it yeah. Jay, two last questions, and, and this is, thank you again. This has been truly amazing. Uh, thank you for your time. You. Um, I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been the lowest business moment and how you push through it? And then on the flip side, what's been the proudest um, for you? Well, the lowest is already self-evident when my wife passed away. That's, yeah. Yeah, self-evident. Yeah. That was really bad. That's and, the lowest uh, of the low, yeah. Yeah, you, I, I couldn't get much lower than that. I, can, I, can only, I don't even want to think about things that could be worse than that. Right. So that was, that was by far the worst. I was able to get through it. i am uh, got that paradox of feeling blessed and sad simultaneously. And I'm still sad every day. Yeah. But I'm also blessed and feel very optimistic and grateful yeah. for where I am today. So yeah. that's... that's um, that took a lot of work and thinking and introspection and support from family, friends, and my associates here. Yeah. As far as the high point, yeah. it seems like every day is another high point. Yeah. Because as you're incrementally improving, and I really think it's more about evolving, yeah. evolving seems to happen almost every second. Like a tree doesn't just sometimes grow and doesn't grow. Right. Every second, the cells are hopefully getting a little bit bigger and growing. Right. And that's how I feel about myself. Yeah. And as I feel like we get more and more capabilities and more people who are doing things that I don't do, and I don't even know what the hell they're doing sometimes, I'll be walking by a meeting room and see people, and I don't even know who some of the people are. I think, that is so cool. I don't even know who they are, but I know they're smart. I know they're doing a good job, I know they're organized, and I know they're probably going to get this done on time, right. whatever it is. Right. And I think that's a blessing to feel like what I was doing when I was working seven days a week and doing everything myself. Right. And now there's people who I don't even know their name. And in some cases, sometimes I see somebody I, I didn't even know that they worked for us, and they're doing a great job. That's, that's pretty some cool. Some of them probably don't even know who you are. Is that possible? <laughs> Maybe we do an all hands meeting every okay. Thursday. Okay. I'm actually at the Maybe front. not. So if they don't know, they're really not okay. paying attention. To they're like, who's this guy? Like, oh, he's the boss. <laughs> it is funny when people just start, but there's enough pictures of me going around. Okay. To figure they know who I am. Okay. Selling the company was obviously. Yeah. So how do you point. celebrate? How do you celebrate after Home Depot? It's official. How did we celebrate? Yeah. Uh, we had a 30 year old bottle of Macallan. Okay. That was a little Ohioan for, for that. Right. And then we, um, we just got to work yeah. and said, all right, we've done that. Now let's, let's keep going. And now we've got an opportunity to propel, propel ourselves and do something really of significance. Yeah. So just kept doing what we yeah. were doing. Yeah. 
Jay, fantastic. We didn't get to talk about the barbershop quartet, which is amazing. Maybe there's some videos I can clip in on that. Other videos online about yeah. that? Okay. And also, I just want to note, you know, you, you also give back a lot. And I see, you know, stuff with prison entrepreneurship programs and helping vet days with through the, the building opportunities right. that you guys provide too. So it's just... And the one great thing that we're doing, which is not quite as as uh, benevolent as what you're talking about, but I'm part of XPRIZE. XPRIZE, yeah. Yeah, and XPRIZE is really cool because you've got all these amazing entrepreneurs that are just trying to change civilization and make do things that through incented prizes that could never have been yeah. done before. Yeah. And being part of that and having using money for that purpose with virtual reality, augmented reality, and science, and yeah. all the things, all the exponential technology that is here and now, yeah. and will be completely changing the world, that's another way to continue to stay improving, yeah. experimenting, and having fun. Yeah. Jay, thank you again. Everyone should check out blinds.com. Anywhere else we should point people towards, maybe Inc. to check out your, your articles. Anywhere else online? That... Inc.com, blinds.com, either okay. of those, okay. that would be fine. Look yeah. at, check out XPRIZE. That's XPRIZE. Really yeah. XPRIZE, yeah. Dot org. Great. You know, I, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Um, I'm honored that you felt that I would somehow help your show. And thank you very much yeah. for that opportunity. Yeah. Really. Jay, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. No brainer blinds and shades. Installation of wood and aluminum blinds. You'll receive clear instructions and all necessary hardware. Attach the brackets. Put the valance clip on the head rail. Slip the blind into the brackets. Snap on the valance. It's a no brainer. No brainer blinds and shades. Installation of cellular shades. You'll receive clear instructions and all necessary hardware. Attach the brackets. Fasten the shade to the brackets. It's a no brainer.